Hello, those of you watching on YouTube, my Wayside family and listeners all over the world. This is the second in a series of study on sacrifice. Uh, last week we saw sacrifice instituted in Eden. This week the topic is second generation dilemma. Adam and Eve learned about sacrifice the hard way after sin um, was first committed. And now we see uh, that we can learn more about sacrifice as we look at Cain and Abel's life. Last week we mentioned that hermeneutics was the study of Bible interpretation. We talked about the first mention principle. If you want to find out about a topic in the Bible, go to where it's first mentioned and study and see what's revealed to you there. The second uh, principle of hermeneutics I want to bring out is progressive revelation, meaning that our understanding of a doctrine builds as we progress through Scripture. So sacrifice instituted in Eden, and now we're going to see more about sacrifice in the story of Cain and Abel from Genesis chapter 4. We do actually have to look ahead into Leviticus to get some light on this interpretation, but that's the beauty of having the entire Bible to glean from. The second principle that we want to talk about today is the Christocentric principle. Uh, that simply means that we view the whole of Scripture with Christ as the focal point. The types in the Old Testament point forward to Calvary. Our redemption looks back to Calvary. So we can see some um, facts. We could see some parallels and pictures, types, if you will, in the story of Cain and Abel. And keep Christ in mind as you read through this story. So the direction was to uh, read Genesis chapter 4, first eight verses to glean through those. Uh, and, then, uh, and then we're going to summarize those. I'm going to give you some uh, bullet point things. But if you want, you can pause the video here and read those verses because I think it'll be important for you to uh, know what it says before we just go through and give the Cliff Notes version. So pause, take a minute, read those, and then unpause and come back. So if we're viewing this as a cliff notes type thing. First of all, we see that we have two sons that are born to Adam and Eve. Uh, they reach at least young adulthood and have occupations. One is a tiller of the ground, a farmer. The other is uh, tends sheep. He was a keeper of sheep. He was a shepherd. Uh, they each offer sacrifices in line with their type of work. We also find out that one sacrifice is accepted and one is rejected. Cain is given a chance to make good on his offering and refuses to do so. And then Cain doubles down on his iniquity and kills Abel. It wasn't just far enough for him to uh, offer the wrong kind of sacrifice and to become mad at God. He takes his anger out on another human being and you have the first murder take place in Scripture. Now I have not given every detail of this and every every possible application of this story. Just wanted to kind of refresh your memory on the story of Cain and Abel as you read. So it brings to the question, and this is the primary thrust of this lesson. Why was Abel's sacrifice accepted but not Cain's? Well, first of all, let's look at some reasons, um, some non-reasons, if you will. It was not due to God playing favorites between the two boys. Now, someone may want to bring up a verse and say, wait a second, I think I read somewhere in the Bible that God said that he loved one person and hated another, and, and yet uh, there's another place where you talk about um, where, where God used a person, uh, was a, a vessel fitted for destruction, and, and, and Jude talks about some, um, some individuals who were, um, who were going to be punished for their, uh, for their part in carrying out God's will. I mean, you look at a guy like Judas Iscariot. He did what was necessary to accomplish God's will, but he'll ultimately, he'll ultimately pay for his, for his betrayal. Well, we have a passage here, Romans 9, 9 through 13, um, just a phrase that I've extracted from there. says, Jacob have I loved, and Esau have I hated. Why would God hate Esau? Matter of fact, the verse prior to that says, even while they were in their mother's womb, when neither had done right or wrong, it was just a matter of um, 
Esau was hated. Well, what is what is the Bible? How can we reconcile that? We we know that God is love, right? So how can we say that Esau was hated? Well, first of all, let's talk about things that God does hate. God's hatred of sin in the Bible is referred to as abhorrence. Those sins are abominations, and there's no room for sin anywhere near His holiness. You often hear people talk about, I love the sinner and hate the sin. That's exactly what God's position is towards sin. He hates sin. There's never an opportunity where he says, or there's never an occasion where God says, well, in this case, I can understand why somebody sinned, so I'm going to let it slide. There's never room for sin. However, when it comes to people, God loves people, and then he also loves less. Um, when we talk about love and hate, it's really a comparative term. Those he loves are called his chosen ones. Jacob was chosen to be the lineage of the Messiah, not Esau. Esau was the older brother. As a matter of fact, we have some parallels here with this story. Cain is the older brother. Esau was the older brother, but he wasn't chosen. Uh, Jacob was chosen. Uh, even in the New Testament, we see Jesus issuing a call to disciples. He says, if any man will come after me, let him die himself, take up his cross and follow me. He says in another place, if any hate not his father, his mother, his brethren, and even his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And when you look at that, you're like, well, how in the world? I'm supposed to hate my parents? I love my parents. How could I hate them? How could I hate my brother? How could I hate myself? None of us can do that. Hate here is the same descriptive, comparative term that God uses when he talks about, I've loved Jacob and hated Esau. What he's asking you to do there is he's asking you to love less than. You've got to love your parents less than God. You have to love your brother less than God. You have to love yourself less than God. God has to be supreme. So between Jacob and Esau, Jacob was the preferred one, the chosen one. So this is not just a matter of, of God saying, well, I don't care for you, Cain. Uh, I'm not, it wasn't a matter of playing favorites and making Abel the favorite. Matter of fact, I'm going to propose to you that if anything, Cain was the preferred brother. Immediately after the sacrifice, it says that Cain became wroth. He was angry with God. His countenance fell. We'll look at, at wrath and countenance in a minute here. But what he says in verse 7, God says to Cain, If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. He gives Cain a chance to make the right kind of sacrifice there. In other words, the first part he's saying, if you do well, if you do the right thing, you'll be accepted. He says, if you don't do the right thing, then uh, there is a provision for you not doing the right thing. Sin lies at the door. In the original languages, the same word is used for sin and sin offering. So what you're really reading there is, Cain, if you do right, everything will be all right. And if you sin, if you do wrong, there is a sacrifice for sin. There's an opportunity to make things right. Reading the second part of verse 7, it says, And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. In other words, Cain, you can have the proper relationship with your brother. You can have the proper connection with your family. You can be the preferred child. You can be the one that I use. And Abel will serve you. He will carry out your wishes. You will have the rights and privileges of the firstborn. That's why I say, if anything, God preferred Cain based on the second half of that verse. God loved Cain. It was not a matter of playing favorites against Cain. The second thing I want to talk about, though, the reason that, that uh, a reason, a non reason that Abel's sacrifice was accepted but not Cain's, it was not due to a binary choice where God had to accept one and reject the other. When I say binary, 
I simply mean when you come to a choice where there must be one or the other. When you come uh, to a T intersection, you must turn right, you must turn left. There's no option to go straight forward or there's no, there's no third way to go. There has to be one or the other. This was not a fork in the road where God said, well, I've got to choose somebody's offering. I can't take them both and I have to choose one or the other and I must reject one to accept the other. Now I want to bring up those who are enemies of God or so of their own choosing. Um, whenever, uh, I mean, in the same instance, I could say, all right, you and I are attempting to serve the Lord and we have some minor differences between us and God has to accept my sacrifice and offering and worship and he, he must reject yours. That's untrue. Um, now, we are going to look at some, uh, the fundamental difference between these two offerings. But it did not just indicate a difference where God had to accept one or the other and, and Abel's was slightly better, so he chose that. Another non-reason for the rejection of Cain's sacrifice. This is a partial non-reason, so bear with me. It was not solely based on blood sacrifice versus non-blood sacrifice. Most people tend to think or tend to preach it in a way that, well, you know that Hebrews 9.22 says, without the shedding of blood is no remission. And that is true. That is 100% true. The first half of the verse also says, and almost all things are purged by, by blood. We mentioned last week that... Um, Leviticus chapter 2 represents that there is one type of offering that does not require blood, does not require bloodshed. It is the meat offering. Uh, meat offering, uh, you'll hear it referred to in commentary sometimes as a, as a meal offering or a grain offering uh, in other passages. And that simply means that it's, it is the fruit of the ground. It does not involve uh, killing an animal, shedding an animal's blood. Four of the five do require shedding of blood. One type does not. So exclusively based on the types of sacrifice that were given later in Leviticus, the first five chapters of Leviticus, each detail a different type of sacrifice. And one of the sacrifices does not require blood. So we can't necessarily say it was just blood versus non-blood. God accepted Abel's blood sacrifice. God rejected Cain's non-blood sacrifice. But here's where the rub comes. The meat offering, the meal offering, is never to be offered alone without a type of offering which would require an animal sacrifice. Matter of fact, we find multiple places in the Old Testament, not just the instruction about the meat offering or meal offering, but we find instances where people gave uh, the meal offering and it was offered with a blood sacrifice. And I'll get into that a little more. Uh, now we get to the real reason. The real issue with why Abel's sacrifice was accepted and Cain's was rejected. It was due to the posture with which each entered into worship through sacrifice. It was due to the posture with which each entered into worship through sacrifice. Some things I want to tell you here. Uh, first of all, Abel entered God's presence with an animal sacrifice. And that was undoubtedly in obedience to the instructions that Adam would have relayed to his sons. See, God doesn't leave us guessing about his will. And this is the memory verse for this week's lesson. Micah 6.8 says this, He hath showed thee, O man, what is good. And what doth the Lord require thee but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God? So many young people want to know what God's will for their life is. Well... That's not necessarily exactly what they want. A lot of times they want to know, who am I going to marry? Where am I going to go to college? What kind of job am I going to have? Where will I live? How many stories will my house have? How many acres will I live on? What kind of car will I drive? They just want to know the future. They don't necessarily want to know God's will because God's will is clearly spelled out for us. God never leaves us guessing about his will. If we Just reading Micah 6.8, what does he want us to do? What does the Lord require of us? To do justly to do the right thing, to obey his laws, and to love mercy. Um, loving mercy involves being merciful 
to others. It involves being very gracious and forgiving and loving. And to walk humbly with our God, he, he requires humility. Uh, we, we know what God wants from us. God never leaves us guessing about what is necessary. You say, well, the Bible doesn't record Adam telling Abel. Um, this is a book that covers 2,500 years of human history. We cannot have every conversation recorded. The reason that I presume, and I don't think it's a stretch at all to presume or assume that Adam gave Abel instruction for sacrifice, is that also Adam gave Eve instruction for what tree to avoid in the, in the Garden of Eden. Eve fully knew, even though she wasn't there to hear it firsthand. Likewise, I believe that God told Abel and Cain what kind of sacrifice was acceptable based on what we know about the Garden of Eden and God killing an animal and using the skins to cover Adam and Eve. Second thing which you see here, Cain met God with only the meal offering. Remember a little earlier, we talked about... Um, the fact that the meal offering was always supposed to be offered with another offering. It wouldn't have been difficult for Cain to have obtained a sheep to use for sacrifice. He knew somebody that raised sheep. He had the ability to uh, ask him very easily and uh, maybe even trade some fruit of the ground for a sheep to use so that he could offer the right kind of sheep. But he was too proud to ask another for help, especially a lowly shepherd. I've got Genesis 4, 47, 6 in parentheses here because something that you'll find is the Egyptians despised shepherds as well. We know that Jacob's sons, not just farm, but they were also shepherds and they were not allowed to live in Egypt with the rest of the Egyptians. No, they were assigned to live in Goshen. Um, and uh, that, was, uh, that was because the Egyptians despised shepherds. I find it uh, not coincidental at all that Jesus Christ referred to himself as a good shepherd who gives his life for his sheep because he was also despised and rejected. Third thing I want you to see... Uh, is note that the verses of Genesis 4 do not say that God had respect unto the boy's offering, or he had no respect unto their offering. The verses say this, And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. The next verse, Unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. The foremost things here, not that if Cain had had a right attitude, uh, it would have superseded the type of offering he was supposed to bring. But if Cain had the right attitude, he would have brought the right offering. The fact is, the foremost things here were the hearts of these men. Cain's heart and Abel's heart were miles apart. Primary difference here was the posture that each brought to worship. Abel's heart and Abel's sacrifice was accepted. Cain's rebellious heart and his sacrifice offered out of rebellion were rejected. Now we're going to go into that meat offering or the meal offering a little more. Even if a meal offering were permissible without a blood offering, Cain defied the typology. The meal offering indicated the total surrender of the one making the offering. Total surrender. Cain's reaction turned from happiness or satisfaction to extreme wrath. When you read the words in there, talking about his countenance fell. Countenance simply means facial expression. He had a smile, or at least had a neutral expression, that turned into a frown. It turned into anger. You can picture his face of his, of his uh, instead of a frown turning upside down, you can picture his smile turning upside down into a face of rage. And I see that as an indicator that his pride was hurt. Now we need to go into something so that we have an opportunity to see what's not explicitly mentioned when we read through those first eight verses. Whenever Eve delivered Cain, Cain being her firstborn son, 
it is possible that she had daughters before this, but Cain would be the firstborn son. We read there verse 1, she says, I have gotten a man from the Lord. When it says she's gotten a man from the Lord, we go back to Genesis 3.15, where in Genesis 3.15 it was promised, uh, the verse says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman. This is God talking to the serpent. Between thy seed and her seed. Uh, that is the offspring of those. The offspring of the woman. And uh, it says, It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. It, the seed of the woman, a promised Messiah in the future, would bruise the head of the serpent, while the serpent would bruise the heel of the Messiah. When you look at the cross of Calvary, that's exactly what happened. His heel was driven through with uh, a nail. Uh, his hands were driven with nails. His heel was bruised, but Satan's head was crushed there on Calvary. Now, we know that to be Jesus Christ, but Eve knew that somewhere along the line, there would be a promised deliverer, someone who would make right what they did in the Garden of Eden. And when she had Cain, she thought, this is the one. Not just a man from the Lord, but I've gotten the man from the Lord. Um, in some cases, we, we read this, and or in some um, translations, uh, back in the... Uh, back in the Hebrew, it's almost written as, I have gotten a man, comma, the Lord. This is the one. He's the one who's going to redeem us. I'm sure that that was probably conveyed to Cain somewhere along the way. You're the chosen one, buddy. You're the one who's going to deliver us, even if it was incorrect. Cain had to have pride over that. Cain had pride over being an excellent farmer. We know that he uh, was very good. Because part of the curse for killing Abel was that the earth would not yield her fruit to Cain to the extent that it had. In other words, production would be decreased because of what, uh, because of what he had done to Abel. Cain fully expected and deserved to be accepted by God. This is the best fruit that I can grow. It's very beautiful. I've worked very hard on it. I've sweated. I've put forth the effort. And my mother also told me that I am the promised one. I am the man from the Lord. Uh, he was very prideful. And to tell the truth, he was going through the motions of a surrender offering without truly being surrendered. That was Cain's issue. Cain was full of pride. Cain's feelings was hurt. His countenance fell and he was wroth. He was full of wrath. And he carried it out on his brother, then denied the murder, and then was caught out. And the only reason that he wasn't killed on the spot by God is that capital punishment had not been instituted yet. That's my personal belief. Um, because God did raise up Seth in Abel's place. But that's an entirely other lesson. Cain and Abel. Cain was rejected. Abel was accepted because of the posture in which they came to worship. So that is the uh, that is the lesson for this week, and we'll be back with you next week. Thanks for watching.